for me to be back and to fellowship with you around our wonderful Lord in the Word of the Lord. And as we have been looking at a number of passages this week, I trust it has blessed your heart as it has certainly blessed mine in the study of the Word in light of the various figures of speech under the literal truth of God living within our body and that body spoken of as various types of buildings and we are certainly those various building materials that go into the overall building of God. Now this morning I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn with me to another passage that deals with truth concerning our Bible under the figure of speech of a building and that is 2nd Corinthians chapter 5. 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 and would you follow along in your Bibles as I read for you beginning with verse 1 down through verse 10 and uh, just uh, by way of maybe a few helpful uh, thoughts for you to uh, pin your metal, mental hat as we uh, uh, progress along I'd like to suggest for you a little bit of an outline as the Apostle Paul moved by the Spirit of God to pen these words in the first four verses you have a house of contemplation that which the Apostle Paul by the Spirit of God contemplates is a testimony from heaven and then in verse 5 the certainty of that contemplation and then in verses 6 through 8 his confidence in light of the contemplation and certainty and then verses 9 and 10 the conduct in light of that which has preceded follow along now as I read for you this particular portion for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life now he that has wrought us for the self same thing is gone who also has given unto us the earnest of the spirit <coughs> therefore we are always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body we're absent from the Lord for we walk by faith not by sight we're confident I say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad or more accurately good or worthless now as we stated in the first four verses we have the contemplation which is before us and notice some very striking and wonderful uh, contrasts in light of the contemplation that he suggests for us for we know now here's a matter that's well settled as far as the apostle paul is concerned and uh, it is not something that is sort of a superstition with him you know sometimes I have the fear that many in the realm of Christianity are walking in a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ in such an estranged manner that many things which the Bible has to say concerning the future is somewhat of uh, an attitude like this well I sure hope it make it I sure hope it might be so well this is not the case with the Apostle Paul at all absolutely not for we know it's something that's absolutely settled and the contemplation which he has is a contemplation with a settled heart and he's just looking forward to it for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved <coughs> we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens notice a few contrasts here I'm sure that you're aware that we have the figure of speech that the house relates to a body that's our body the body that we live and move and have our being in and first of all I'm introduced 
to the truth of this body as being an earthly house of this tabernacle. Or it is an earth-made tent house. It's a tent house. In contrast, if you please, to a building of God. Now this building of God, and it's a building literally out of God, I am told is not made with hands, it's eternal in the heavens. Now a tent is a very temporary abode. And so he's setting before us a contrast. That which is temporary and that which is eternal. And then a contrast as to the character of the dwellings. It is a tent earth house. That's a heavenly eternal abode. Now, um, in the summertime, it's a strange thing that we see walking along Trans-Canada Highway as it goes through the Northland Bible College property, some 18 miles north of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. That particular highway is pretty well populated with a lot of hitchhikers. And you'll find one little tent after another little tent uh, pitched along the road as they're wending their way across Canada someplace. You know, <laughs> since the temperature got below zero, I haven't found any tents <laughs> parked along that road at all up there. <laughs> you see, the tents are not very comfortable in below zero weather. And I haven't seen too many tents right down here either this time. No, the fire feels pretty good, isn't that right? Inside the four walls. Well, the contrast is simply this. Your body and my body is pictured as a temporary earthly tent house compared to the eternal abode awaiting us. And then I'm told that this tent house doesn't last too long. It gets pretty well weather beaten at times. And it's going to be dissolved. And you and I have an appointment. Hebrews 9 tells us that. Every single person that has breathed the breath of life upon the face of this earth has an appointment with physical death unless the rapture meets us first. Now, all of us have it. Makes lots of difference how we're prepared to meet it. At this point, you've got a tent house. And I don't know about your house, but mine is getting a little wobbly. The uh, breeze of time and uh, the difficulties of trials are causing the tent pegs to sort of pull out. And that thing moves around. Something like this last October, when another brother and I went way up north moose hunting. We got away back into that bushland. Beautiful, beautiful country. Wild. And uh, we put up a tent. And uh, we also put up something else. We put up a, a little um, a canopy over the tent just to help uh, by way of weather and storm. Well, you know, one night it began to blow. And that old tent top began to whip and the pegs began to pull out. And I thought, well, now, am I going to have to get out of the sleeping bag? But we had to do some repairing in the morning. The hydro lines had been broken. We really had a blow. Now that tent, that tent, wasn't the most commodious place to be uh, sleeping that evening. Folks, we spend a lot of time with our tents. Rightfully so. We're to take heed with reference to our body. 
But I wonder, have you given much thought to the contrast of your tent with your dwelling? That's eternal. And I'm asking you this morning with reference to sense of value. We just feel we have to so live in this world that ever accommodation that we can obtain for the satisfaction of our tent house, we should spend our time, we should spend our efforts, we should spend our means. You stop and think about it for a little while, folks. The tent doesn't last. The tent, according to the Scripture, going to be dissolved. But you've got one that isn't going to be dissolved. It's eternal, but it's in the heavens. Now I think we ought to sit back and begin to do some evaluating. Everyone that lives in a little building and is, is having a home built according to a blueprint and according to their desires, they look forward to moving out of the little building into the nice new home that's been constructed. Everyone. Folks, that cannot compare with what awaits you if you know my Savior as your Savior. Now then, in verses 2 through 4, we have a number of attitudes that are brought to our attention with reference to this wonderful heavenly home, which is ours. The new body, if you please. Notice verse 2. For in this we, what? Groan. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Let me ask you something. Is that your attitude? Is it? Is it my attitude? Oh, no, I, 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 I don't want to leave here. I don't want to move out of this tent. Could it be that we have not grown spiritually? Could it be that we have not had such a precious walk with our Lord? That anticipation of that which he has for us, we haven't given it much thought. And we don't want to leave here. We don't want to move. I um, was just a young pastor. First year I went to Canada. Maybe I've given you this illustration, but it will serve to point the truth to us in this at this juncture. I received a phone call and the lady on the other end said, could you visit in my home? I'm caring for a man who is bedridden, who has muscular dystrophy. And he would like for you to call and read to him and explain some things about the Bible. I said, I'd be happy to. And I did make the call. I was graciously ushered into the little room where Harry was in the bed. I pulled up a chair next to him and started talking and reading to him. And then I noticed something. Mabel got a chair, pulled it up the end of the bed and sat there. And she'd do this on every occasion. And one time she said this, Dr. Clock, I'm homesick for heaven. I looked at her. And she said, I mean that. I'm homesick for heaven. Here I was Dr. Flock. I was there to minister. 
I walked out of that building so convicted. Do you know why? <laughs> I wasn't homesick for heaven at all. Man, I was young. I had this old world to conquer. I had a message to go around the world, and I was going to hit her hard. Me? Homesick for heaven? No. Now, Lord, just let's just put off that appointment for a full long time. I got things to do. Yeah, see them in a minute. And then, a year or so later, Mabel was in the hospital with terminal cancer. I visited her. There was a smile. Her homesickness for heaven was about to be realized. And she was anticipating it. The Lord has chewed on me. And he's worked on me. And I can honestly stand before you today and tell you something. Heaven is far more precious to me now than it's ever been. The more I study the Word and the more I see the futility in a real sense of the earthly pilgrimage in contrast to all of the treasure house of heaven in the presence of my Lord. Well, I'll tell you of grace. Now let's just look at this. He said, I'm groaning and I earnestly desire. Here's a man that had walked with the Lord whose heart throbbed with his who felt the pulse of the Spirit of God in relationship to a wonderful anticipation in the heavenlies. Yes. Now then, in verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle, we do groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And all there's so many contrasts here. But it's just the attitudes that I want to share with you this morning. The groaning, the earnest desire. And would you please notice in verse 4, burden. <laughs> oh, well, I know what that means. Well, I've got all kinds of burdens. I've got the burdens of the bills. I've got the burdens of the problems. And I'm just burdened down. But what's the burden here? It's the burden of blessing. You know, wouldn't it be fantastic if the believers in this day and age would be so burdened down with the blessing of God, with the joy of the Lord? That would be their burden. Instead of this old temple materialistic life that's going to just go like that one of these days? Burden, 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 burden. Everyone's got a burden. But be very few have the burden of the blessedness of anticipation. You know, in, um, in the fourth chapter, in this same book, can I read something to you? In verse, seven, in verse 17, well, verse 16 and 17, For which cause we faint not, <coughs> but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day <clears throat> for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. <laughs> the trials are spoken of as featherweights. But the glory that awaits a believer is spoken of as Tons and tons of glory. My, what a comparison. And what a contrast. And precious brother and sister in Christ, this is yours. 
And the real problem is we don't even know the blessedness that God has for us. You see, we haven't taken time to get into the book. We are too worried with our tent house. We've got so many burdens with the tents. The contemplation. Reference to the body. 2 Corinthians 5. A house, the subdivision where it's found, is in heaven. The character of that house is eternal. And every one of us is going to have it. Marvelous. Well, can this be certain? Can you be sure of it? Notice verse 5. The certainty of it. Now he who has wrought us for the self same thing as God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. How certain can a person be? On a twofold count, you have here two members of the triune Godhead brought to our attention to verify and to establish without a shadow of a doubt that the contemplation is absolutely certain. You see, the one who has worked us for this thing is God. Well, that's what it tells us in verse 1 anyway. House from God. Now then, God is the Father in the heavenlies who has this home all ready for me. <laughs> and then secondly, you know what he's done? From heaven to earth, he is also giving, has given, an earthly guarantee, which is what? The earnest of the Spirit. Do you know what the earnest of the Spirit is? We don't talk much about earnest anymore. But earnest is earnest money, which is simply a down payment on something that guarantees more to come. <laughs> Lyle and I walked down those streets in Fort Collins, Colorado, and we looked, stopped there in a jewelry store, just like you know, young people will do. All right, uh, which one shall we get? Huh? I went in there, and she said, I, I like that one. Well, if you like that one, then that's the one we're going to get. And then I asked him, how much is it? He told me. I said, we'll, we'll take it, yeah, but uh, uh, you'll have to put it back. I'll give you so much down, and then it'll keep coming down, 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 down. Until I finally had it paid off, and I could give it to her. But the earnest is the down payment that there's more to come. Now, here in verse 5, the certainty of this wonderful home is that God has guaranteed it in the heavenlies and He's guaranteed it on earth that I will realize it by the Spirit of God indwelling me. For He has given unto each one of us the earnest of the Spirit. If you trusted Jesus as your Savior, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And that his down payment on earth of the guarantee of the home in the heavenlies. You see, I'm guaranteed of this contemplation. Guaranteed of it in heaven and guaranteed of it on earth. And I'll tell you, you can't get better security than that. You might place your uh, money in these securities and that securities, but watch out for the income. Why, Canada is just on the teeter-totter up there. Their money is going down and down and down. And you go into the bank, they say, oh, we're just wearing to death about it. You are. <laughs> it doesn't bother me a great deal. Because uh, <laughs> I don't understand it in the first place. And if I did understand it, it wouldn't do me any good. But uh, just what he has, that's what we'll do. But, oh, this. This is security, folks. And then in light of the certainty, 
He demonstrates his confidence in a twofold manner. Notice verse 6 through 8 now. Therefore, once in a while, we get the feeling that we can be confident about this. Is this what your Bible says? This is what my Bible says. My Bible says, therefore, we are always confident. Knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And then verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, you see, the confidence that he's demonstrating here is, is simply this. <clears throat> now, I know that while I'm here, he says, my life is simply a life of faith, not of sight. Now, I'm perfectly confident of that. And faith for me now, he says, is absolutely adequate. I believe what he says. What God has declared, that's good enough for me. We got so many people that are trying to be so smart, so much smarter than God, they gotta to add to this and they gotta think that this isn't adequate, so they have to have other standards to raise standards above our missions. I'll tell you one of these days, that kind of an attitude is gonna be answerable before God, and we're gonna read about it in just a moment. Right now, all the confidence I need. And I'll guarantee you one thing as a personal testimony this morning. All the confidence I need and all the confidence I have is wrapped up in what God says in His Word. And that's enough. That's settled in me. You can out-argue me all you want to. I'm not hard to argue down. And you can pose this problem, pose that problem. I'm going to leave you with those burdens. I want the burden of the blessing. And then the second confidence is manifested in verse 8. And he says this, and it deals with an attitude. We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He's already told us that, hasn't he? Earnestly, longing, groaning, burden, desiring. Oh, is this true for you and for me? Hold your hand here and turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Many of you can quote it, and we can quote it, but I'd just like for you to see. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, <coughs> down through <coughs> 23. And this strikes me very forcibly with reference to the type of an attitude of the spiritual heart that is genuine today and just you just do not have a, uh, a theoretical Christianity. He tells me in verse 21, For me to live is Christ, and to die is the saddest thing in the world. Is that what your Bible says? <laughs> For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's harvest time. All of the labor's over with. The benefits come at death. Death. That's true. No, I know what First Thessalonians 4 says. For I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that, are, those that are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. Now, there's sorrow at physical death. But who does the sorrow in? Hmm? Those that are left. Isn't that right? Those that are left are the ones that have the problem. That's true. And you know, I've often thought of it like this. To be too overcome at physical death is right down self-pity. Do you know that? Poor me, poor me. I've left, I've left, I've left. Everything revolves around poor me, poor me. Right? We haven't stopped. And I don't wish to make light of it. 
but I fear our spiritual lives have not been so attuned to him that we see the greatness of what takes place for me to die is gain. You know what the Psalms say? Precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious. Precious. We stop, we, we fail to see the tremendous benefit for the one who's gone ahead. That's right. I know there's sorrow. I know there's heartache, but I wonder if a lot of it isn't self-pity. And uh, says, if I live in the flesh, it's going to be the fruit of my labor. Yet what I choose, I know not. Verse 23, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to, to depart and to be with Christ, which is such a dreadful authority. Far, far better. Do you see the attitude of the heart of a man who realizes that he lives in a tent and he's got something greater to move into? Oh, precious people, how are our hearts and our lives Are we spiritually dead, so to speak? We've allowed the things of this life to so dull heaven's values that we're so earthbound that the silver and the gold and the three score and ten and all the impelling things in our lives. Well, what kind of conduct should we have in light of this? And you know, that's just what he talks about now. You have your contemplation, the certainty of it, the confidence, and now notice his conduct. Wherefore, we are ambitious. That whether present or absent, we may be literally well-pleasing to him. Well, please. Now listen, there's two major things I want you to see. First of all, he says, when one contemplates things like this, he's ambitious. Ambitious. And to be ambitious is to have a life that is full of activity and one that's just chafing at the bit constantly to really serve, in light of the last part of this, serve to make one pleased with your life. Come along about Christmas time. And you have the loved ones and the family. And uh, you begin to think, don't you? What expression of love can I manifest to my dear one which will please him or please her? We begin to think, what will make the children happy? What will make our wives happy, our husbands happy, our loved ones happy. The Apostle Paul, you know, there's one impelling thing for me, and that's to make my Lord happy. And he says that we may be well-pleasing unto him.
I haven't come to criticize you. And I haven't come to hurt you, dear people. And you know I love you in the bonds of the Lord. But I'm just going to ask you the question. Really, how ambitious are you? Reference to things of the Lord. Hmm? I don't know how to get it across. And I don't know what to say. But folks, there are such needs today. If you were with me on our little mission field, you'd see. I wish I had about ten kids right now I could put out right in some spots up there. Well, there's no witness. No witness. <laughs> right on the border. And you've got lots of spots right down here that need some witness, too. And then my mind goes back. I had ten years, ten solid years of formal education beyond my high school days. Four from my bachelor's, four from my master's, and two more from my doctorate. Ten years. And in those ten years of study, do you know I can only pick out just about three men that ever indicated a life every indicated a life of real spiritual value. All wrapped up in educational standards. I know we have to have standards, but I think that's the greatest one right there. All wrapped up in certain other things. Supposedly, have some kind of a professional ministerial uh, uh, acceptability. Oh, oh, that we would have tents like the tabernacle that shone forth the Shekinah glory of one who dwells within. The Naos, the shrine in the holies. That this tabernacle, being ambitious, not a convenience if I feel all right to get up to go to a service here and there, but out in that. Apostle Paul spent three years on the Arabian desert. Moses, 40 years in the Midian Desert, and then they became great deliverers for God. They tried to do it their, their way. God said, nothing doing. We do not accept that method. And then the sad thing about it, folks, is verse 10. If you don't have a conduct like verse 9... There's a guarantee of verse 10. For we must, a few of us, no, sir, for we must all, A-L-F, did you hear that? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What? Why? That everyone, not just some, not just a few of the preachers and the teachers and etc., but everyone, everyone. You there? You sure are. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. The tent house. A 
according to what? That he has practiced, whether it be good or worthless. How long is the Greek word? <coughs> There's no judgment for sin. Calvary took care of the sin question. But the judgment seat of Christ is going to take care of the conduct question. Now, your ambition or lack of it is going to be there. And we've seen it in 1 Corinthians 3, how you've been building upon the foundation Christ Jesus, whether it be gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hair, stubble. And you're going to be there. And I'm going to be there. An inspection day. And it says that I may receive receive at that time. Literally carry off his booty. Those things done on the body. Now 1 Corinthians 3 tells me if they abide, I'll receive a reward. If they're burned, I'll suffer loss. Hold your hand here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. 412. And I'll tell you, we might have our little three score and ten uh, parties and uh, just uh, while our way through it with our little preconceived standards and how the world does it and how they're going to accept us and all of that. But let me read Hebrews 4, verse 12 and 13. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creation that is not manifest in his sight but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we literally have to give the answer. There it is. All young people, moms and dads, and everyone else, if we believe what God's Word says, that there is nothing hidden from his gaze, and as it tells me in Lamentations, Thou, God, seest me, it would take care of every one of the parked cars. It would take care of every one of the smutty stories. It would take care of every one of the illicit relations and conduct and the manner of recreation and the type of songs that we sing and the beat to them. The way we look, the way we conduct ourselves in this world, are we walking as men, or are we walking as citizens of heaven? What does it say? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone, now you can let it roll off now if you want to, And your problem isn't with me. You may be just hopping mad at me right now. Well, folks, I don't want to make you mad. But if you're mad, you better go to God and get the thing straightened out. And you know that the Bible's right. Every one of us Everyone may receive the things done in the body according to these done. Whether it's good or worthless, as we noticed the standards last night, the spiritual sacrifices of the believer for good works, the kit of tools the Word of God and the doer of the book 
and not a hearer. You satisfied with a shallow life. Is that what you want? You satisfied with the life of the flesh? Are you? You know something? I'll cry with you in 2 Corinthians 5.10 because you know better now if not before. Now then you see 2 Corinthians 5.10 is a time when you're going to receive what kind of furniture that you're going to have in this house in heaven. 